Now for the talk, we have Matthew Leeds, who works in LS, and he came all the way from San Francisco. And he's going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer distribution of flatbacks and Oil Street. OK. So my talk is peer-to-peer -peer distribution of flatbacks and OS trees. As she said, I'm Matthew, and I work at Endless. Okay, so I did an internship at Red Hat in 2016, uh, got me started contributing to GNOME, now I've been an endless for a year, went to Alabama, and there's a picture of my dog. So um, some terminology that you need to know, OS tree, probably everyone's already familiar with OS tree and Flatback, but just in case you're not, it's basically Git um, for operating system binaries, and endless uses it to make the OS immutable and do atomic upgrades. And then Flatpak is another consumer of OS tree and it uses it to store its applications, which are um, sandboxed and packaged in a way that works across any Linux distribution. Um, and then a little bit more terminology, um, OS tree refs are just kind of like Git refs, so there's an, a ref for each app and runtime and each OS release and some metadata like app stream data, um, which is basically what GNOME software uses to show you the screenshots and descriptions and everything that makes the application easy to, to understand. Uh, and then there's also OS3 repo metadata that is um, not something users have to worry about, but something that is an important implementation detail because it has things like the GBG keys. Uh, so what was, the, what was the need that motivated peer-to-peer uh, -peer updates? Um, Basically, most of the world still doesn't have an internet connection, and even the people that have one, it's a bad one. It's usually slow or intermittent, um, and so you should be able to do updates on your computer without being connected to the internet. Um, most, as far as I know, most of the other OSs don't really have a way to do this. Like Chrome OS definitely doesn't, Windows doesn't, as far as I know, Mac OS doesn't. So it's it's a rare a rare thing. Um, and even if you have fast internet and you live in the first world, there's still other use, case, use cases for it. Um, for example, the Fedora or Red Hat Enterprise Linux installer will probably use this technology to pre-install flat packs because it allows you to mirror them um, in a way that it works better than an alternative. Um, and you might also just want to have a machine that stays offline and you still want to be able to update it. Or you want to mirror um, some refs from another repo without being the organization that originally, that has the original server. So there are some other use cases. Um, and here's some more motivation for it. There's actually a 1.7 gigabyte app on FlatHub, which is kind of ridiculous because it's bigger than the runtimes. Um, yeah, you can see the KDE runtime is 600 megabytes, GNOME is 500, free desktop is 400. So if you haven't installed any apps yet or you're, you have an old version of one of those runtimes installed, you're gonna have to install the new runtime and that takes, you know, a little bit of a long time even on a good internet connection. So you can kind of understand the, the motivation for the feature there. So the, yeah, the solution is being able to do updates peer to peer. And when I say peer to peer, I mean over USB drives and over local networks. Um, so that's installs and updates for apps and then updates for the OS because it's already easy to install an OS over a USB drive. And what does, that, what does that actually look like for the user? So, you know, most Linux users or Linux developers tend to like to use the command line, but we don't want that experience for users. So they should be able to use the graphical interface to, to do all of this. Um, that is copying the apps or the OS updates onto the USB and getting them back off of it to do app installs and updates and OS updates. Um, and LAN, ideally, LAN updates should work without any configuration also. You shouldn't have to uh, designate one computer as the server and designate the rest as clients. Um, it should just work without any configuration. But we're not quite there yet. There's still more work to do in the coming months to get there. Right now it's basically a command line experience and um, you have to designate one computer as a server for the LAN updates. But that's something we're working on. Um, okay, so what about the implementation details of that? So what you need to do is teach OS tree how to fetch refs from USBs and LANs. So it doesn't seem like it would be that hard, right? 
just need to add a few more sources rather than the internet. Um, because then once you have it in OS tree, Flatpak can use it too. But it turns out it's actually pretty hard. We've been, <laughs> we've been working on this feature for a year and a half at least, something like that. So two years, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, I've only been an endless for a year, so I haven't seen all of it. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a long time. It's been a hard feature with lots of bugs that come out. And basically the reason for that is that we've made um, very invasive changes to both OS3 and Flatpak that um, change a lot about how they work. So, th so the reason that we've need to needed to make those changes is that, you know, kind of throughout those two code bases, the assumption is made that you're always online and the assumption is made that uh, the apps that you have are strongly tied to a remote that you have configured. So, um, you know, the way OS tree works is that you configure a bunch of remotes, like one is Flathub and one is maybe the endless remote, uh, and then you install things from them. And they are, they are tied back to that remote name. You have the remote name that's stored in the metadata, but you don't have um, any like globally unique thing that you can use to, to identify it other than that. So, you know, another user might have the remote name configured as something slightly different, or if you try to use the, um, the URL, the, you know, the URL could change at some point. So you can't uh, just take a set of refs that you have installed and um, it's not easy to make them globally unique. Hopefully that'll make more sense later on. So yeah, the, the question is how can we disambiguate refs from different remotes? Um, As I just said, you can't really use the remote name or the URL. You can't even really use the GPG keys either, even though those are pretty much unique to each remote um, because it's not guaranteed that you're, they're unique to each remote and they can change over time. Um, so just, just to be clear about that problem in case it's not clear, um, you know, two different Flatpak remotes could provide the same exact app ID, um, even though that, that doesn't happen very often. And, uh, the other case where it's useful is like for the OS stream metadata and the app stream refs, which are the same for every repo. So there's, you know, an app stream ref for Flathub and there's one for the endless apps repo um, and you need to be able to differentiate them. So you can't just use the word Flathub because that's not necessarily globally unique. You have to use, uh, you know, reverse DNS names just like the app IDs use. So yeah, that solution is basically collection IDs. Um, Uh, so just in case anyone hasn't used Flatback before, it already uses reverse DNS names for the app IDs. So like vim I think is org.vim.vim so that it's globally unique. Um, and so this is just the same thing but per repo. So Flathub has a, a collection ID that's org.flathub.stable um, and you know endless has ones that start with com.endlessm. And basically the idea is that when you pair that with a ref you get a globally unique pair. Um, and that solves the problem of being able to re redistribute refs and knowing like exactly where they came from. So another problem uh, that comes up in the implementation is how to distribute repo metadata. Um, so the way OS tree works right now is that it uses a, a summary file um, that is basically, it tells you every ref that is provided as well as some other metadata. Uh, and the summary file gets signed on the server by the server's GPG keys. Uh, so when you want to have your computer mirror just some of those refs and not all of them, there's no way that you can create a valid summary file. Because if you, if you generate a summary file that has just those refs that you're mirroring and not all of them, not all of the ones that are on the server, you have no way to sign it because you don't have the GPT keys that are used on the server. Um, so yeah, basically the summary file, it's an, another example of an implementation detail that assumes that everything is just coming from a single source and that you're always online. Uh, so the idea that was uh, come up with was to use just a well-known ref that doesn't have any content on it and just use the, the commit metadata to store that repo metadata. Um, and that way, because commit metadata is signed, you can just redistribute that for each remote um, and then you can use unsigned summary files because you can generate your summary file that has, you know, a valid list of all the refs from different remotes that you're mirroring 
Um, and it doesn't matter that it's unsigned because the, the part that matters for security, which is the metadata, is signed when the commit metadata is signed. So hopefully that didn't get too deep in the details. <laughs> and speaking of details, this is the uh, part of the API in libos tree. There's you know, a lot of it, but this is just the part that's kind of interesting. Um, I guess one, one important thing to point out there is the OS tree repo finder set there that's a, an array. Basically, there's an implementation for each place that you could find refs. So there's one for configured remotes, there's one for um, LAN peers, and there's one for USB drives. Um, so then each, each implementation, you know, just does its own work of finding the remotes and returns back an OS tree remote. Um, yeah, so basically what this API is saying is I have this list of refs, I don't care where they come from, they can come from USB, LAN, or internet, um, just, just get me them however you want. And then the second API is just pulling them, so. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay, so what are the actual implementation details of how that um, OS tree repo finder implementation for USB drives works? Um, and by the way, I, you know, you say USB drives, but really it just looks for mounted file systems. So you could use maybe like a network mount if you wanted, and at least the way it's written right now, that would work. Uh, but the idea is just to have like a well-known location on the USB drive, uh, and it's called like .os tree slash repo, and the, the repo finder implementation knows to look for that. So any, um, any drive that has that will be searched for the refs that you want. And so how do you, uh, how do you get your, your apps and, and runtimes into that repo? Um, for, you know, for OS tree refs, you can use the OS tree create USB command, um, and for Flatpaks, you can use the Flatpak create USB command, except you can't because it hasn't been merged yet, but after it has, you'll be able to. <laughs> uh, and yeah, the difference is just that Flatpak knows how to also include the runtimes and apps and, um, you know, metadata, things like that. You know, I, I guess most users just wouldn't know what to do with it if they saw it in the file manager. I don't know. Um, it's not like there's a nice interface when you're looking at it in Nautilus that says, oh, delete these refs. You know, it's just, it just looks like garbage, I guess. Uh, but that's something that could be debated, I guess. Uh, and then what about for on a local network? <clears throat> So DNS SD stands for DNS Service Discovery. Um, it's like basically when you're looking for printers, for example, on your network, that's how you find them. Um, and in this case, we're not using it for printers, we're using it for OS tree refs. Um, so we just made up a new service type, OS tree repo, um, and then you can broadcast um, you know, DNS SD records on your local network um, that basically just say, I have these refs to give, if you want any of them, pull them from me. Um, and the, the specific way that it does that is using a bloom filter, which is kind of interesting because it is, uh, is space efficient, so if you have like a ton of refs that you're advertising, you don't have to list every single one. Instead, you can just put it in a filter that um, the client will get, you can look at it and say, okay, my ref is either definitely not there or it's possibly there. Um, so if it's possibly there, then you can pull from the peer and see if it actually is. Um, and so the way that you generate those DNS SD records is using a component of EOS updater called EOS updater Avahi. And uh, if another operating system wants to implement this, they could. Um, you know, obviously it's open source, but Endless is the only one doing it right now at least. And then EOS update server is also important there because it's just serving EOS tree repo, but that's not Super interesting, it's basically just an HTTP server. And Philip Whitnall did most of the implementation work on that, so he deserves a lot of credit. Um, and he just kind of handed it off to me to do bug fixes and things like that. All right, so we're gonna try to do a demo. Yeah, 
so I have the WikiArt app installed right now. Um, you have to have something installed to put it on a USB, at least the way it works right now. trying to clear up the state from the last time I did it. Okay. I don't think this is actually on. Oh, it is. Yeah, so again, this is not the experience that we really want for end users. We want people to just be able to click a button, um, but we don't quite have that yet. So all you have to do on the command line is tell it, you know, where your mounted USB drive is and what app you want to put on there. And then uh, you can see right here, it's not just putting the app on there, it's also putting the uh, runtime and the app stream data and the OS stream metadata, all that other interesting stuff. Extensions uh, for each app are also included. Um, but yeah, basically all this is doing is, you know, creating an OS tree repo on the USB drive and pulling the refs from the system repo into that. Which takes a little while because the run times are pretty big. <laughs> and unfortunately I didn't, uh, you know, prepare a LAN update demo, but it probably wouldn't have worked anyway, so. So yeah, there's still like several bugs left to fix with this, but we're hoping to deploy at least USB updates in the next few months. Um, and when I say deploy, I mean, uh, so the way it works is that collection IDs can either be enabled on the server um, or the server and the client. So once we have them enabled like for FlatHub, for example, which is almost ready, um, you can just run like one flatback command to enable it on the client side and then you would be able to do USB updates.
Um, yeah, so you know, Flatpak and OS tree both have you know, more upstream than we have downstream in endless, really. Um, there's still bugs to fix, but everything that has been fixed has been merged pretty much. And then we might as well go offline because you shouldn't have to be online to do this, obviously. Definitely not much more. <laughs> but I guess if anyone has questions while we're waiting. So now I'm offline um, and I still have it installed, but if I uninstall it, and then I should be able to install it from the USB. Seem to work. And there's the app that we installed offline. <laughs> uh, and yeah, again, that's not the experience that we really want. You should be able to plug in the USB drive, and GNOME software would just open, and you'd be able to click an install button. Um, but this is a little easier to demo. And, uh, and one other thing, like, you might wonder why you can't just use Flatpak bundles for this, because you can, you know, create a Flatpak bundle and then install from that offline. Um, but that doesn't work well for a few reasons. Like, it doesn't work, it doesn't allow you to update really easily. Um, and you have to, like, bundle the runtime also. And, you know, it's just a lot harder to, to deal with for a number of reasons. You can bundle runtime, yeah. So that's the left to be done slide. I'm not sure I'm going to read all of that. Um, clearly, there's a lot of work left to be done. <laughs> it would be interesting. One thing down at the bottom that's interesting is like, it'd be cool to implement BitTorrent for this, because sharing OS trees with people on your LAN is like a useful case for like a classroom environment. But just for people that are on the internet, you know, usually you're not. You don't have that many people on this your same local network that need them, but people on the internet, of course, there's plenty. So that would, I'm sure that would take a lot of pressure off of Flathub and their uh, server bill. For the avoidance of doubt, can you uh, confirm whether or not this works with extra data flat packs like the proprietary stuff that a load of things uh, yeah. download? Yeah, good point. So it does not work with extra data flat packs. Uh, like, for example, Spotify is an example of an extra data flat pack. But people who are offline probably don't want to use Spotify anyway, so it's not a huge uh, you know, detriment. And it's not like fundamental 
you know, you could implement support for extra data probably. It'd just be a lot of work. Um, for the network updates, what happens if you have like a rogue server showing updates for apps with malicious, malicious updates? I mean, the thing that you explain with the mm, commits without it, well, I didn't understand, but um, is it supported that make sure that it comes from, from a real update from the yeah. origin? Well, it is GPG signed, so for someone malicious, to make a malicious update, you'd have to, you know, steal the GPG keys. Uh, that means that you need to add the repository, you need to be connected once to add the repository to get the keys, right? Um, you do need to have the remote configured, yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we could also try updates if we have time. But. Uh, if you need to do integration with uh, Nautilus, it's probably about four lines in an XML file. Like the integration in Nautilus so that when you plug it in, you browse in Nautilus to your storage media or even like a, a remote file share. You can, you can have a ribbon show up just the same way as you already have for like audio CDs, launching sound juicer or video DVDs, uh, you know, showing up in the video player. So the, the way it works right now is in Nautilus, there's a button that you can click and it takes you to GNOME software. Um, what, what are you saying the experience would be like? But if you already have that, that means that you already know the XML file to modify it to, to, to add that experience, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 